Lord, we come into your presence again today from homes and places all over the city. God, we are aware of your presence, even in our homes, even in our cars, wherever we are. God, we thank you that when we sing songs like we are going to today, saying, Jesus, come down, or spirit fall, that we know that you're already with us, but we're just asking you to move, asking you to speak and move in our lives, in our world, in our city. God, cover the brokenness, bring healing. God, we thank you for the way that you move and we ask you to do it again in a way that only can be explained by you, God.
Come fall afresh on me Come wake me from my sleep Blow through the caverns of my soul Pouring me to This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my day
Jesus, we just come to you this morning and we just say that without you, God, we are lost. We were lost, God, until you sought us out, until you found us, until you brought us into your fold. And Jesus, we thank you for that. And God, I pray that we would not just be desperate for you during this time of uncertainty, but that we would be desperate for you always. God, would you grow up a desperation in our body, in this church, for you and for your word, that that would be our truth and our foundation, that we would come out of this time stronger than ever. And God, I pray that you prepare our hearts for this morning to hear what you have for us. God, we thank you for how much you love us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. There's a number of passages in the Old Testament that talk about God's relationship with his people. And there are a few passages that literally talk about how when they come to worship him, that he doesn't hear them that there is something that shuts down this flow of worship and this flow of communication between God and his people. He says in Isaiah chapter one specifically that as you come to me in worship and you bring your offerings to me, that I don't even hear them, that they are an abomination to me. And he gives this reason why in verse 16 and 17, he basically calls them to ask for forgiveness, to wash themselves, to make yourselves clean to remove the evil from your deeds. And here's what he says, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. God's commentary to his people of Israel was that they were not moving into those places of oppression and those areas of darkness where the vulnerable are living and helping correct those injustices. Our God is a God of justice. And so as we look at these areas of how we should be living, there's a call for the church to act justly and to love justice, to represent a God who is a just God, who hears the voice of the oppressed, who hears the voices of the vulnerable in our society today and moves towards them. It is because of that that we have chosen to really insert this ministry to the vulnerable into our purpose statement at Ridge Missions. Our purpose statement is simply that God's compassionate pursuit of all people compels us to reach the unreached around the world and to serve the vulnerable. And so we want to be able to do that in very specific ways, both in our city and around the world. I am excited to finally be able to uh, introduce a relationship and official partnership with International Justice Mission. IJM is a world-renowned, faith-based, Christ-centered ministry that specifically works among the oppressed and the vulnerable around the world. But the organization started as a group of lawyers and attorneys with a desire to fix the problem at its root, and that is within the law and the justice systems around the world. The core of why they are moving into these areas is because of the compassion of Jesus Christ and a desire for the gospel to be lived out in those areas. So we have started a new partnership with IJM and specifically in the region of Southeast Asia, in Bangkok, Thailand, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and also in the Philippines. We're here wrapping up a trip uh, to Thailand and Cambodia and have learned a lot about the work that is going on with IJM in these two offices. These two offices are unique to IJM because they are actually working together to combat one cause, and that is forced labor slavery in the fishing industry here in this region. The poverty here is deep. And so as is usually the case, poverty creates a desperation for relief. And so many men are looking for ways to be able to support their families and are being lured into the lie of money to be made in the fishing industry. What happens is that when they get to the boats, their passports are taken, the promise of big money is never followed through, and they literally are sold and entrapped into this, this fishing industry. And so this is modern day slavery. Part of what makes slavery an issue today is not only not being paid for what you're doing, but also the lack of freedom to be able to move around. 
And so these young men, many of them are boys, are put onto these boats and are not allowed to leave. Their passports are taken, their phones are taken, and they are literally trapped on these boats out in the ocean for months and sometimes even years at a time. So IJM is working to not only identify where this is taking place, but also to free these predominantly young men that are stuck on these boats, bringing the perpetrators to justice, and then working with local governments to be able to change the laws so that the long-term uh, solutions are in place that slavery can be minimized over the coming years. Austin Ridge is gonna be financially supporting IJM for the next few years to help support the work that is going on in this region with IJM, but what we need to be able to do is join them on a regular basis, specifically praying for the work that is happening here. Part of the reason why prayer is so important is, is that it shows a dependence that we have on an almighty God to change things that we can't change in and of ourselves. And the truth of the matter is, is that the work that IJM is doing the work that they are confronted with on a daily basis of seeing the, 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 the depths of depravity in so many of the places that they work is that they realize that they can't do this work alone. And so prayer to them, therefore prayer to us, is of vital importance to be able to engage on a regular basis for asking God to do what only He can do. What would it look like if our lives were completely dependent on the Lord through prayer and expressing that dependence to Him with an acknowledgement that we can't do life on our own? That is exactly why we not only need to be praying ourselves, but want to join IJM in the prayer for these people and for these changes of justice systems around the world. Wow, I mean, God is doing so many things around the world. He's allowing Austin Ridge Bible Church to be a part of it. Guys, this is Don Ellsworth. Don is our missions pastor here at the Ridge. Don and I have been working together for 16 years. He was in my original search team when they hired me. Uh, so this is a dear friend of mine. Don, we mentioned Cambodia, we mentioned Thailand, we mentioned forced labor and all the atrocities we're seeing. But there's another place we didn't have in this video yet that yeah. I'm excited about. Why don't you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, well, IJM's region in Southeast Asia includes also the Philippines. And so the work of forced labor slavery in uh, Thailand and Cambodia is one aspect that we just saw. And in the Philippines, they're working specifically with online sexual exploitation of children. Uh, it's uh, shortened by the term OSEC. And so the work that they're doing there is, it's just gut-wrenching. And so they are working there to uh, find the perpetrators, free the kids, and again, work within the law enforcement and legislation within Philippines to help stop that. The Philippines is the number one exporter of child pornography. And so the work there is strategic and, uh, and super important. And you told me, what's the number one importer of child pornography from the Philippines? U.S. The yeah. U.S. Yeah right here, home. Yeah. One good piece of news that's kind of fun during these days of COVID, uh, you can imagine that the demand for pornography has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the IJM staff in the Philippines has been able to continue their work. And even uh, as of earlier this month, they've been able to free uh, dozens of kids, uh, upwards to 60 kids that have been freed and are now in aftercare, uh, and nine perpetrators uh, that are, are working in this industry. So the work continues, it's slow, it's a little bit like a drop in the bucket, but it continues and we're excited and give thanks to the Lord for that. And we talk about how do you eat an elephant, you eat it one bite at a time. Uh, we can't stop all injustice in the world, but we can sure fight hard against some. Right. And God's putting us in some, some very uh, strategic places Don's team's amazing. He and Clark Richardson work together on these things, and we are looking for more places to fight injustice. And guys, that means in the city here too, and in, in Austin, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in my sermon here in a few minutes. But I wanna pray, and I'm gonna pray for the workers that, I mean, there were certain pictures we can't even show you on that video because we have to protect privacy. Right. People are in parts of the world that are just dark. And guys, this stuff happens in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So let me pray, and then we're gonna uh, get in the Word together. Father, thank you so much for International Justice Mission that they are talented young men and women, older men and women, who come from all different ethnicities from all over the world. Some have lived in this injustice. Some have only read about it and heard about it. 
but they all have a passion to fight the things that you fight, the injustice in the world, the oppressors in the world, that we can free people from slavery that's happening all over this world. Uh, Father, we lift up uh, the Philippines, and we want to see revival happen there. We want to see the gospel open and change lives. And Father, we want to be a part of the solution to stop child trafficking in the Philippines. And Father, I thank you for what you're doing in Cambodia and Thailand. And Father, this is a monumental task in the fact that how do you even trace boats that are way off the coast? Mm -hmm. How do you identify with people that have lost their identity? Father, give wisdom, mm -hmm. give clarity, um, open up your servants in these places uh, from our church, from other places, from International Justice Mission. Open up our minds so that we can think creatively yes. and so we can be on page with you because we know you have a heart to fight these injustices. Mm -hmm. And Father, you haven't come back yet, so that means the task is not complete. Mm -hmm. And we're going to keep working hard here at the Ridge. Uh, give Don and Clark and his team just incredible wisdom as well as they lead us. And may we see uh, you pull things off only you can do. And we get to be a small part of that. May we see the joy of the Lord in building kingdom so that others can be freed mm -hmm. and the oppressed can be persecuted and even bring the gospel to the oppressed. Yes. Even see men and women that are in darkness because these oppressors are in darkness as well. We want folks to yes. encounter you. Lord, we lift all this up to you and pray that today, uh, as we're about to open your word, that you would speak to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Austin Ridge, good morning. It is great to be with you again. Uh, I want you to know before I start, and you can go ahead and start turning to Luke chapter four. Um, I want to be back as a church more than any of you do, I promise you. Like, I do not like preaching in a room by myself, and we're making the best of it we can, but it is not fun not to be with you. And, you know, I've gotten some emails lately about people not understanding why we're not meeting or not understanding why we're still not meeting. And, you know, I get emails from people thanking me for not meeting yet. And guys, I know the opinions are all across the board on here. I just want you to know the elder board and I are really praying, the staff's praying about when, how, what it looks like. We're also doing a lot of construction on this campus, which makes it difficult as well. Uh, I'll be talking to you here in the next week or so about some of our thoughts of, of what that will look like. But I just wanted you to know that uh, we want to meet again, and it will happen. It will happen soon, hopefully. Uh, so I'm going to be in Luke 4 doing something a little different. I'm actually taking about three characters today and putting them in the same story, mainly because the storyteller, the first character is Jesus himself. And he puts two characters in this. This text in Luke 4 I'm going to teach you today is actually... What gave me the idea of Cast of Characters back in 2017, and again, now we're in part two of Cast of Characters. Jesus is the greatest storyteller of all time, and he does a sermon here, and he actually brings two Old Testament characters, which we're going to put all that together and do it together as a character today. Uh, Luke chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit of Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So Jesus is now starting his public ministry. It's after the temptation earlier in chapter 4. He starts preaching. Uh, the Puritans used to say, if you have one son, make that son a preacher. And so Jesus, his, part of his, a huge part of his ministry was sustained by preaching and teaching the Word of God. And that's why I'm so committed to preaching what we call... Uh, expositional preaching where you go verse by verse. I'm committed to it. Our staff's committed to it. We want to have good preaching here at Austin Ridge. We want to have good preachers at Austin Ridge, and we're going to keep sharpening our skill to hopefully do that well. Jesus is now preaching. Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth. That's his hometown where he had been brought up. And he, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, 
He grew up going to the synagogue. I imagine he heard some bad sermons, which I would cannot imagine preaching in front of Jesus. I understand what it feels like to go preach in your hometown. I've done that. I'm, I'm from a little town in South Carolina called Fountain Inn. And I've preached at that church that I grew up in. And it is so difficult. And I'll tell you why it's difficult. Not because people aren't sweet. They're very sweet. But because they're always reminiscing. So when I'm preaching at my home church, it's not... Uh, the senior pastor from Austria's Bible Church is, oh, there's little Brad Thomas. I had him in my fifth grade class. I taught him t-ball in, in second grade. And it, it's hard when you go back. So Jesus is preaching in his hometown and everybody's happy to see him. Matter of fact, he goes to Nazareth and the Bible says, what uh, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, the best thing came from Nazareth. His name is Jesus. But look how this changes a little bit here. Verse 17, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This was about 2,700 years ago. This was written probably 700 years before the time of Christ. He's handed a scroll, God's sovereign, this exact scroll that he wanted to read, that he knew he was going to read that day. He quotes from Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 58 and 61. And he says really four things. And I want you to look at what he says here in these verses. Number one, he says, he has, God the Father has appointed me. He hasn't said that's him yet, but he will. Has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He's offering the same grace salvation, forgiveness of sins, seat at the table of, of, of heaven to the poor and the rich, which means that there's no seating in a church for the really poor people. There's no seating in the church, better seating for the rich people. Rich people can be saved and poor people can be saved. So he's bringing a, uh, an equality to those that are fortunate and those that are less fortunate. But the goal is the same. He wants to proclaim good news to those people. So those people, whether rich or poor, still are not necessarily children of God yet. He wants them to hear the gospel so they can become children of God. Number two, he says, I want to bring liberty to the captives. Those are POWs. Those are people in prison, enslaved. Those are people that are still captives. Um, we, we at the Ridge, I mean, you saw the video, we want to fight injustice in the world because God fights injustice. Because God's heart is against injustice. We want to set captives free like Jesus did. And, and the sad thing is, and I want you to realize, is you and I are self-selecting slaves. Some of us are slaves to food. Some of us are slaves to our hobbies. Some of us are slaves to money. Some of us are slaves to uh, fitness, drugs, alcohol, food, gambling, entertainment. We are all self-selecting slaves. So the gospel is supposed to free all of us from doing what our body tells us to do. But part of the gospel is also using it to fight against true physical slavery that's happening in our world. People do not need just behavioral modification or self-esteem. People need to get saved so they can be freed. For some people in this world, it's sad to say freedom won't come until heaven comes. But we want to fight more and more people to encounter a physical freedom and also a spiritual freedom as well. The third thing Jesus says is recovering sight to the blind. You remember John the Baptist actually says, behold, the king, the king who comes to take away the sins of the earth, pointing to Jesus. He says, his sandals I'm unworthy to untie. He must increase, I must decrease. Not long after that, John the Baptist, because of his witness, gets in prison, ultimately gets his head taken off for the gospel, becomes a martyr. But while he's in prison, he starts having doubts just like you and I would. And John the Baptist asks people, is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? Would you go ask him? So his men go and ask Jesus. Jesus says this to John the Baptist or, or to his messengers. He says, tell John the Baptist this, that the blind are receiving their sight. How do you know if Jesus is really who he said he is, the blind are now seeing. And so now here he says, I've come to recover sight to the blind. You know, here at the Ridge, we believe that Jesus can heal people. We believe here at the Ridge, he heals physically. He heals, heals spiritually. We believe that. Now, do we see physical he uh, healing all the time? No, we don't. Have I seen it at times? Yes, I have. 
But our job is not about physically healing people. Our job is about praying that the healer, the divine healer, would heal people. Sometimes it's not God's desire to heal someone that we pray for. Sometimes it's his desire to take them home. And, and I think, again, we're going to get to heaven one day and part of our beef is going to be, why did you make me stay at that place so long? And, and we're the ones to be pitied. But for some people, he does heal. And then he says a fourth thing. He says, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And the oppression here are those who are being abused. That's why I'm so excited that here at the Ridge, many of you are foster parents. Many of you have adopted children out of tough situations. Many of you work with Mobilos and Fishes where we give over 30,000 meals a year to help feed people. Many of you have given to our COVID fund. Uh, I want you to know we've given almost $400,000 away just the last few months. We've given that to feed people in the city of Austin, to feed people around the world. We've given that to feed people in Uganda because in Uganda, not only is COVID happening, but they also had a tremendous flood just a few months ago and people lost their homes. We have given them $60,000 of your generous tithing to help people just through our care team, our care ministry, knowing people in our body that are hurting. We want to also with Jesus set at liberty those who are oppressed. We also want to see that in our black community. We want to care for black people very sensitively because they are going through oppression in our country. Sometimes our Asian population goes through oppression in our country. Our Latino brothers and sisters go through oppression in our country. We want to help those, as Jesus says, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Folks, that is happening all over the world. And that's what Austin Ridge wants to be about because that's what Jesus is about. Now, Luke chapter four, look at verse 19. After he quotes and reads from the prophet Isaiah, he says, I'm sorry, in verse 20, he says, and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's interesting because Look at verse 19 again. He says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, if you go back to Isaiah, if you go back to Isaiah chapter uh, 61, verse 2, Isaiah says the same thing. He says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But Isaiah says another phrase. He says, and the day of vengeance of our God. To proclaim the, the, the year of the Lord's favor and to, as, as Isaiah says, the vengeance of the Lord our God. Jesus leaves off the second part of that. Why? The Old Testament looks at the coming of the Lord and the vengeance of the Lord as one drama, one act. The New Testament sees it as two acts. He came, act one, and the second time he comes back is going to be as the judge. He will bring vengeance on those that have disobeyed him, that have not believed in him, that have oppressed, that have caused these things that he's praying about, that have set people captive. Jesus separates those two things. But what Jesus says here, he says it also in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Meaning this, when I come back the second time, I will come as judge. So again, here in this situation, we see right now we're in a time between the time of the first act, Jesus came, the second act, he's coming back. We call that a time of great grace and great joy and great patience. We have a full canon. We have 66 books. There is no 67th book. Someone knocks on your door and says, I got a new revelation. We don't need it. The canon is complete. And we await the second act to start. But until that act starts, you and I, guess what? We live in oppression. We live in racism. We live in, in, in people starving when there's food being thrown away. We live in children being used monetarily through sex trafficking. We live in a world where people are more in love with their addictions than they are with the God who created them. So right now we have a fight on our hands. And Jesus doesn't talk about that vengeance of the day of the Lord yet. He's on mission. Jesus' mission is Austin and Ridd's mission. The church is called the body of Christ. It ought to grieve us when people are oppressed and abused. And that's true in the city of Austin. That's also true for people we'll never meet. Why would y'all go spend money in Thailand? Why would y'all go to Cambodia? Why would y'all go to the Philippines? Because Jesus cares for those people. And so we must. 
It's interesting, um, Martin Niemöller, he, he died at, at the age of 92. He was a German pastor. He survived the Nazi concentration camp. I want you to hear what this amazing pastor says. And it's going to be just a few sentences. He says, he once said in Germany, this pastor said this, in Germany, they came first for the communists. And I did not speak up because I am not a communist. And then he said, they came for the Jews. I did not speak up because I'm not a Jew. Then he said they came for the trade unionist and I didn't speak up because I'm not a trade unionist. Then he said they came for the Catholics and I didn't speak up because I'm a Protestant. Listen to what he says. He says, then they came for me. By that time, there was no one left to speak up. Folks, why do we care about Cambodia? Why do we care about Thailand? Why do we care about the Philippines? Why do we care about the Asian community, the, the black community, the white community? Why do we care about Latino community? Because if we don't speak and fight for injustice and oppression, who will? If the people of God are not going to be the voice of God and the hands of God and the generosity of God and the grace and mercy of God, the representation of God, who will? So folks, we need to get out of our comfort zones. We need to get a little uncomfortable in opening our eyes and seeing the oppression around us. Over the last few months, we've been reminded about that oppression in the black community. That is real racism. It has happened in this country for a long time, really forever since this country has been here. It happens against other communities and other skin colors in our culture as well. It is our job to be the representatives of the gospel of Christ. We are, the Bible says, ambassadors. Now look down with me at verse 20. He rolled the scroll up, he gave it back. Verse 21, he began to say to them, today it's been fulfilled in me. What he's saying is, I'm the promised one, I'm the Messiah. This is what would get him killed. Verse 22, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? They were doing what happens when I go back to my home church. He is so well spoken. He is so educated. He's so eloquent. Well, they don't say that about me, but they're saying that about Jesus. Amazing words of truth. They, they love it. Wait, that's Joseph's boy. Wow, one of ours. Look at verse 23. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in the hometown as well. Jesus is prepping, saying, now you're going to want me to do some miracles and some signs because that's what you've heard I do. Verse 24, and he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. I won't say I'm unacceptable in my hometown, but I do understand how this is hard to go back and to preach to people who watch you grow up. So he says, I am fulfilling this prophecy in front of you today. But he's also saying, don't get all excited yet. My sermon's not over. I haven't offended you yet because every good sermon is an equal opportunity offender. Look at verse 25. This is interesting. But in truth, this is Jesus. I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. Does that not seem so out of context? I just read Isaiah. I am sat down. This prophecy has been fulfilled. Now he starts talking about a widow in the time of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. That's because of a drought. And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. What is Jesus talking about? This is what's going to get him in trouble in this text with the people. Remember, we leave off. They're saying, you're amazing. You're an eloquent speaker. Unbelievable. Blown away. That's Joseph's kids. You're one of ours. You're our hero. Let's put a ring of honor name up. Then he starts talking about a widow. I want to go back. This is our first character sketch that Jesus is bringing to us. First Kings chapter 17 is back in your Old Testament. Just go all the way back. If you want to start in Genesis, you can go right and you'll run into first Kings. And we're going to go to chapter 17. I want to look at the person that he's talking about, this widow. 1 Kings 17. Chapter 17, verse 8. So just to give you a little context, Elijah the prophet has a bounty on his head from King Ahab. Everyone is looking for him because they want to make some money. He is in the wilderness hiding. He is... He is what we would say in a protective area where as long as he stays there, he's safe. Now look with me at 
1 Kings 17, 8. And the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Arise is fine. Go is fine. But then he's going to say, I want you to arise, go, and stay there. How long? See, we always ask the how long question. All right, God, I'm going to go through this painful journey. He was probably 100 miles away from where he had to be. He was going to be exposed. The bounty was on his head. He could get killed. He could get arrested. But he's going to do it. He says, arise and go and stay there. And God, I don't like to stay there part. If that's going to be an hour or two, I'm good. A day or two, that's fine. But if you start talking about weeks and months and years... I don't know if I really trust you enough to just go arise and wait. A long walk in an unprotected, vulnerable space, King Ahab is after him. Now the word Zarephath, where he is leading, in the Greek, the word literally means to smelt or melt like iron and metal. The noun form of that word is crucible. So see, Elijah is going through a crucible. What, what a crucible is, is when the Lord takes you by the hand through a hard time, to make you more like him. Because in our lives, usually it's the hard times that do that and the prosperous times don't. The happy times, tend, we tend to walk away. We see it biblically, we see it in our lives. And so he has got this man in the crucible, but your crucibles are never just about you, so there's also a widow involved. Now this amazing prophet, probably the prophet in our Bible outside of Moses and, and Jesus, that, that share more miracles than anybody else. He's highly esteemed. I want you to go to this place and there's a widow that's going to help you. It's interesting because a widow is someone that's lost her husband. We're going to find out she has a little boy. We're going to find out that she's so poor that she's making one last meal so her and her son can eat and wait to die. And oh, by the way, great prophet, this is the one that's going to help you. But I love Elijah. There's no question here. He just goes. Let's see what happens. Verse 10. So he arose and went, we call that obedience, to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now he doesn't know how poor this woman is yet, but he's about to find out. Verse 12, and she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself, my son, that we may eat it and die. <laughs> I mean, how poor do you have to be to make one meal so you can eat it and wait to die? I I know when the Bible talks about rich people, most of us don't think that includes us. It does. Because, see, our, our problems, people will say, I, I'm not rich. I can only afford an iPhone 7. <laughs> our problem is not, is not starving to death. Our problem is obesity. Our problem is having to work out more because we sit too much. We are the rich people. And it's amazing that the Bible says, to whom much is entrusted, much is expected. Look at verse 13. And Elijah said to her, now he knows how poor she is. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent. The jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her and her household ate for many days. The jar of the flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. Now, I remember when I first read this story, I thought, how rude <laughs> of Elijah. You just found out this woman is so poor, she's making her last meal so her son and she can eat it and wait to die. And what does Elijah do? Hey, I'll take that meal. <laughs> and I think that was a step of faith. He's not being rude. He's calling this woman to faith. Go ahead and give me that little piece of bread, little cracker that you've you got left, and then go back and make you and your son some. So she had to take a step of faith. Elijah, go, arise, go, wait. Now he says to the widow, arise, go, do this. Go, do. You need to obey, trust. And this woman had food for days and days and days until the famine stopped. Jesus is saying this story to what people in Luke 4 the religious people, the church people, the, the people that have heard great sermons, the people that have had great benefit, 
The people that know who God is know the promises of God. He's saying this story. So here's a widow, a, a person in this culture, a woman that's a widow would be looked down upon, impossible to buy land, impossible really to get a job and sustain herself, and uses her and her faith, a woman in a pagan country worshiping the wrong God, uses her to minister and support one of the greatest prophets that Israel has ever known. Now let's go back to Luke 4. Interesting what he does here. Because religious people, I've learned that religious people don't want to hear they're in worse condition than a pagan, loving, wrong uh, side of the tracks born widow. That you're worse off than this person. And he's not done yet. Go back to Luke 4 and look with me at verse 27. And there were many lepers in Israel. Now he's telling character sketch number two. There were many lepers in Israel in, this, in the time of the prophet Elisha. Elisha was mentored by Elijah, so this is protege. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. He brings up another character sketch. Now I want you to go back with me to this one. 2 Kings 5. Are you with me? Three character sketches a day. Cookies top shelf. 2 Kings chapter 5. So he just talked about a, a widow who didn't, it was not a Jewish person, a person that has no means, a very poor person who worshiped the wrong God, the wrong nation, and her faith ministered to the greatest prophet Israel had ever seen outside of Moses. Now he goes to another one. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Naaman, this is the story he's talking about. Naaman, commander of the army, the king of Syria. Syria is north of the northern kingdom of Israel. They were an enemy to Israel. They had already come in and wiped out things. They had already taken people away. We're going to see that in a minute. He was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was, uh, what does it say? A leper. Fascinating story. This is a man, not a Hebrew. He's a high-ranking officer in the Syrian army. We would say he's a four-star general. He is the right-hand man for the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad. But for all the wealth, power, success that he had had, he has a disease of the peasants, leprosy. Israel looked at leprosy as if you were a leper, then you've committed such great sins that God was paying you back through leprosy and you would be kicked out of the community of faith. In Hebrew, this little sentence right here in verse one reads like this. Literally, he's esteemed, he's respected, the Lord made him successful, he's noble, he's valiant, but he's a leper. Now, Naaman, I, I can't imagine the first day that he sees the first spot on his skin. Maybe he's getting out of the shower. Maybe he's laying in bed and he sees the spot. And I imagine there was a hopelessness, a fear. Uh, I imagine there was a, a total distraught understanding of what is my future going to look like. He probably hid it for a while. Probably, hey, name it. Why are you wearing long sleeves? It's so hot today. He's probably hiding it. I want you to see what happens. Verse 2. Now the Syrians, as one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, this is Naaman's wife, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So reverse clock, this Jewish girl gets taken away and she's a worker in the house of Naaman. The same name that Jesus is talking about uh, 2,700 years later. And so she says, if we could get your husband, my master, to this prophet, he can heal people of stuff like this. So it's a very fascinating story because to a Syrian, Eli Elisha was just another hocus pocus witch doctor. It'd be like, it'd be like me going to my boss saying, hey, I need some, some time away. I'm going down to this, this doctor in the mountains down in Honduras and they say that this doctor can heal people. And, and, and the, the, the convicting thing about this is people already thought about the God of Israel. Well, if God of Israel is as powerful as his people say he is, why do they worship all these false gods? Why are they hedging their bets? If their God is really powerful, why are they? I mean, that's convicting. Why do Christians have other idols if the one God is true? 
And so look at, with me at verse 4. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. It's amazing. Hey, Elijah, I want you to go. Arise. There's a widow. Elijah, Elijah tells the widow, I want you to go. Arise and do something. And now there's a Naaman who says, go and arise. He says, I'll go. He's, he's, he's taking a step, but he's still thinking like a, like a non-Christian. Here's what he's thinking. How much does this uh, faith healer guy cost? You know, I've got money. I'll, I'll take all this money because I've got to earn the right to be healed. Naaman thought he could purchase God's favor. And, and I think we do that too. I think a lot of us would rather earn our way into heaven than be there by grace, which is actually what the gospel is. It's religion versus true spirituality. It's why I say, are you a Jesus follower instead of are you a, a, a Christian sometimes? Because the word Christian in our culture carries so many connotations to it. But it's a beautiful word. It's a, it means little Christ, <laughs> that we represent Christ. Are you a Jesus following person? Well, we're going to find out this person's not because he's more than willing to pay his way to a healing than actually uh, have to have faith. Look at verse six. And he brought the letters to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. So the king of Israel is going, I can't heal anyone. I can't make Elisha heal this man. So I think there's a, a fight happening here, he thinks. Verse 8, but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, sends a servant girl out front. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. I, 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 this is one of the scenes in the Bible I wish I could see. Elisha brings up soldiers. They're mounted. There's gold glistening in the sun. They're stacked up clothes. He's got like a big Nordstrom's box over here to give to Elisha. He's got food. He's got all these incredible gifts. He knocks on the door of this humble little place, and a little servant girl opens the little window in the door. Hey, my master's not going to see you, but he said, go dip in the Jordan seven times. Creek clothes. I can't imagine... Because God, here's what I want you to see here. You don't need a holy man. You need Jesus. God's going to tell you what to do. You just need to do it. It doesn't matter who it comes from if it's his truth. There's only one holy man, by the way. His name is Jesus. Look at verse 11. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. And he named some rivers back in his uh, place of Damascus. Aren't these rivers better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So he's sitting here thinking, I want to encounter this God of Israel and this prophet, but I want to do it on my terms. And then when God doesn't respond to him the way he wants him to be responded to, he is enraged. Hey, I can go back to the rivers of Bana and Farfar and the rivers of Damascus. And what he's saying is this is stupid. If it was just a matter of me taking a bath, I can do that back home. He is He's a prideful man. He, he leads armies. Everyone, when he says jump, they say how high. And now all of a sudden he feels like, I can't believe this man wouldn't come see me. Look at what I've done. I've come so far. Now, again, who's he telling the story to? Luke 4, the religious people. It's interesting. He's telling it to the religious people in Nazareth. How do you think they're going to respond to the leper and the widow? Well, let's finish first how this story ends. So... Verse 13, the servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word. The prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? Naaman is so close to going back home and dying with leprosy. And some of his servants, which is risky, 
we're, we're all this way. It can't hurt. The horses need some water anyway. Let's just go do it. Look at verse 14. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Amazing story. Now remember, Luke 4, Jesus is preaching this to religious people. Religious people tend to think that they've got the truth and they don't really care if anyone else has the truth because they're the special chosen servants of God. Religious people usually don't see racism and oppression and slavery around them because as long as they're protected, as long as they're happy, as long as they're comfortable, they really don't have a heart that beats for anyone else. Religious people look at other people and say, well, if they were as smart as I am, they would come to Jesus too, and therefore they just don't get it, so God must have a punishment in store for them. I'm just so glad that God loves me as much as he does. He's talking to religious people. He's talking to you and I, church. Chapter 4, verse 28. Look how the, the audience changes. When they heard these things, those two stories, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could uh, throw him down the cliff, meaning they were going to stone him. Verse 30, Jesus says, I'm not going to let you kill me today. That's really not what it says, but I think that's what he's thinking. Nope, not today. But passing through their midst, he went away. If you got a mob around one person, everybody's mad at the one person, they're about to go stone him. Do you think you can just walk through the crowd and leave? No. But you and I aren't Jesus. Jesus, are you saying a decent, moral, tithing, small group attending, ESV, Bible reading, decent, upright, moral person, in West Austin, in Dripping Springs, in Oak Hill, in the sight of God is just as needy as a widow? That's exactly what he's saying. Are you saying that we're just as horrific in our sin as a leper is with leprosy and we need cleansing? That's exactly what he's saying. And the religious people, as they often do, they would rather kill Jesus than change their religion to true spirituality. You know, folks, my favorite joy in my life has been outside of marrying my wife and parenting my two children is being the pastor at Austin's Bible Church. I have gotten some mean emails over the last few months. Just this week, I got two emails, people telling me we need to start church. Don't know why you're not starting church. What about the First Amendment? What about the Constitution? What about giving in to the culture? Why are we compromising? And on the same day, I got two emails of people saying, thank you for loving us not to start the church, Beth, that you care about our health. Guys, that's, I talk to pastors all the time. There are pastors in this country taking their own lives. I read about two suicides in the last two weeks of pastors at large churches. I just heard about a pastor this past week down in Houston that resigned because he's so depressed walking through these months. As I often think in my mind, I promise you, whatever's going on in your life, whatever struggles you're having, I promise you, I'm not the cause of it. I promise you, I'm not your biggest issue. I'm not your biggest problem. And I don't mind getting upset emails, but I'll tell you this, if we're going to be healthy at Austin Ridge, we don't deal with conflict in emails. We pick up the phone, we call, better we go face to face. We assume the best. We live in a world that everyone's assuming the worst and they don't even ask to see what's true and what's not true. We go to the person and we actually don't talk about the person until we've gone to that person and then we respond to God instead or react. I'll tell you a great way to start a conversation with each other instead of just venting on an email. How about this? Hey, help me understand better what you guys are thinking because I'm a little confused and I just want to understand the process of what you guys are going through. That's a great, healthy way. Hey, I heard you preach. You said this Sunday. Help me understand what, what that's about because I, I just don't quite understand it. That's someone assuming the best, going to the person and responding instead of reacting. Now, folks, I've got a pretty thick skin and I promise you I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> But I want you to know that this church has work to do on being healthy. This church has work to do on being healthy to the black community in Austin. And I want to say this as well. There are some bad cops, but mostly there are amazing, awesome cops. We've got to be healthy toward the police force. There are some bad politicians. I think there's probably a few good politicians. We've got to be healthy toward politics. 
folks, there are some bad pastors. There are some pastors that need to resign. There are some pastors that probably need to be held accountable. But there are some great men, some great women in the pastorate that we need to love tenderly through this time. Guys, we want to fight oppression. We want to free captives. Question, is there another time in the Bible after this that Jesus ever comes back to Nazareth? No, he's done. Nazareth could have been the worldwide headquarters for the worldwide ministry of Jesus' ministry. Revival could have happened. They missed it. Today you go to Nazareth, it's mainly a Muslim town. They still reject Jesus. They still think he's a good prophet until that prophet starts meddling in their real life and then they hate him. He's not a good prophet. He's a false teacher at that point. Jesus provides for us just like the widow. He heals us just like the leper. And some of you are going to reject him and I beg you not to. Frankly, there are a lot of things going on in our culture right now that I don't have answers for. But I promise you I'm praying hard. I promise you I'm wanting the Lord to glorify himself through our church. I promise you that we're working hard to be able to meet again. And at some point, church, we're going to draw a line in the sand and say we're going to provide a service. And if you don't want to come, that's okay. And if you do want to come, we want you to come. But I want you to know that Wherever that line is, there's no right and wrong answers in this stuff. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to ask you to follow because we want to be all in on what God's doing here at the Ridge. God knows where Elijah was. He knows where the widow was. And he knows where you are right now. If you're struggling today, if you're oppressed, he knows. Let us help you here at the Ridge to have freedom in that. Father, you, uh, you may not... You may not know this, but your generosity, like I said, to the coronavirus fund, we've been able to help so many people. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. We just put on our website this past week a statement about racism in this country, about oppression, about injustice, and some of the steps we're taking as a church. We're going to put that link for you here, and you can click on that link, and you can go and see and read and study and learn and pray. And we're going to keep working on this. We're not great at this yet. We want to get great, not because we want to be great. We want Jesus to be seen as great. We want the oppression to stop. That matters in the black community for us. That matters in every skin color in the world for us. I'm going to close with just reading just a few verses. This is Isaiah. We already mentioned him uh, today in our sermon. And I want to encourage you if you are struggling right now with these verses. Isaiah 55, I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 8 and 9. Verse 1, come everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. I love verse 1 because he's saying, I don't care what skin color you have. I do care because I gave it to you. But your skin color does not keep you from truth. Come. Poor, come. Rich, come. Oppressed, come. 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 Then he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Here's what he's saying. I may not do it the way you want me to. And I'm not going to do it the way you ask me to every time, but I'm going to do it the right way. And you're going to have to trust me. Then he says in verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts and your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher. The difference between my ways and God's is his or heaven ways and mine are earth ways. Anybody that's on earth can never say they're wiser than God. They know better than God because we're here. If we knew as much as God, we'd be there. We're not there yet. Then I want to read another verse to you, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. I love this verse. I've, I've said this myself a lot during this time. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Fear not, for I am with you. Folks, let's have a heart that beats for people. There's no sides to take except the side of Jesus. <laughs> there's no heart to have except his heart because we're his ambassadors. A lot of things, there's no right or wrong answers right now. There's just questions. Be patient. Be kind. Read your Bible more than you look at social media. Pray more than you watch the news. 
care about people other than just yourself. Give even if you're wondering if God will provide because you can be assured he will because he sees the widow, he sees the leper, and he knows you. Father, we're so grateful that you care so much for us. And we at times have been so unkind, so rude, so inauthentic towards you. Lord, I pray for people that are hurting in our community here. I pray for my black friends, my brothers and sisters that are hurting in our community and outside of our community, that you would continue to overwhelm them with truth and with the power of your word. Lord, I pray for the Asian community that's just growing like crazy in the city of Austin. I pray for my Latino brothers and sisters in the city of Austin, which they have such a great place in our culture here, but yet at times they can be oppressed and looked down upon. Lord, I pray that you would elevate these brothers and sisters because they're sons and daughters of the King. I pray, Lord, that we would have hearts that, that beat for other people, that we would almost forget our own needs because we're so focused on the needs of everybody else, knowing that you always take care of our needs. Lord, I pray that our heart would break when we hear about injustice like we heard in our video today, that you would show us as a church what it looks like to get boys and girls out of sex trafficking, to get boys and girls and young men and women off boats that they're enslaved to. Lord, help us. Help us to fight this fight well until you come back. That we won't rest until you come back. Lord, I want us to meet as a church soon. I want us to have baptism and take communion. I want us to sing and I want our children to run around these buildings. Lord, show us soon what that looks like, how we can do that well. Thank you for the patience of, of so many in our body that just are trusting the leadership. And Father, I pray that we would just have wisdom from you. Lord, we're grateful today. Thank you. I pray this week we represent you well as your ambassadors. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Austin Ridge. My name is Stephen Hill, Young Adults Pastor here. It's so good to be with you today. Thanks for joining us for worship at home. We've got a few exciting announcements for you. Ministry opportunities coming up this next week in the life of our church. First, our virtual Camp Ridge Kids Week starts tomorrow. There's still spots open for you to encounter God in this way. And we're so excited for the chance for your kids to focus on God's amazing plan for their life and how they can share that with their friends. You can go to austinridge.org slash VCRK. It stands for Virtual Camp Ridge Kids. Register your child, kids of all ages. You can download all the digital resources that our children's ministry team has prepared for a great week for you and your family. We also want to be a church that continues to serve the community around us, even in the midst of this pandemic season. And so we are still doing Project Backpack this month, like we do every August as a church family. This year, it is going to look a bit different. Instead of going to pick up the backpack here at church and filling it up with school supplies that you purchased, we're asking you to go online, austinridge.org slash backpack, and a one-time $50 donation buys a high-quality backpack, fills it with school supplies from our vendor partners, and provides that for kids and families right here in the Austin area. So you can do that today, austinridge.org slash backpack. We are trying to fill 2,200 backpacks backpacks, which is about 400 more than we've ever done. Right now, we've got about a thousand of those taken care of. So we're asking for your help today. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week.